Well, I guess I look like I'm pretty sweet this morning, right? Uh, if you ain't noticed already, I'm standing in the middle of a big game board of candy land this morning, aren't I? Actually, it turns out it's a perfect backdrop for the message that I want to share today. Uh, a board game has a beginning, it has an end, and there's lots of twists and turns that are in between, right? We're going to be looking at how God has a great game plan. <laughs> Better than any game plan of anybody who ever played a game, all right? And um, he's been working this out over the centuries. And I think there'll be a sweet reward for all of us as we come to the end of this one. So. Last week we started a study in the Gospel of Matthew. And it's a study of the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords, Jesus Christ, isn't it? Uh, and that's the theme, that Jesus is a king. That's what you know about the Gospel of Matthew. For a king to be a king, he has to have a royal bloodline, right? So, so when we refer to royal titles such as a, a prince or a princess, what are we saying? That's a son or a daughter of the king and of the queen, right? Uh, and, and they have that right to rule because they are of that bloodline. They come from royalty. And, and today, we're going to read Jesus' genealogy to his earthly father, Joseph. And, and I have a confession to make a little bit here. Reading through genealogies in the scripture isn't, or it didn't used to be, my favorite thing to do, Right? I mean, it's kind of rough. You've got, you've got these names that you can't even pronounce, right? I know you didn't like that when you was in Sunday school and they picked you and your day was the day to read through the genealogies. It's like, please no. I'm going to give you a hint. Nobody knows how to pronounce this. Just go with it. Just let loose and rip, you know. Just work with it, right? Make your best guess. I won't fuss at you, but in these genealogies, these names come across, and they seem boring. This one begat that one, and this one begat that one. This one's the son of this one. No. No. The, every word in the word is important, isn't it? Every word. So there's a reason that these, these genealogies in, is in here. And it seems that we have, we have three options when we're reading through our Bible in a year, and, and we come across these genealogies like this in Matthew chapter 1. One of them is to skip it. I'm not going to ask you all to be honest and tell how many times you've, you've skipped that. The other one, you might be feeling a little more holy that day, and I will skim through it. Right? I'm going to skim through this, and you know, I'll hit the highlights maybe. I'll just kind of, huh, what does what the little the notes at the top tell me? Or you can study it. Now, thankfully, the Word of God actually gives us the answer to this about which one of those three is the best for us to do, to study it, to study it. Turn your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3. All Scripture is given by inspiration of God. All Scripture. And it's profitable. That means it's worth something, right? You can profit from this for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That's a lot of good stuff, right? That the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished, and all good works. According to that, every word in this Bible is important. And we need all the words of God because there's hidden pearls in there that we need to find. Back when I was just kind of, I want to skip over that genealogy, in my mind, I, I would have missed a lot. Even when I just skim over these things, I miss a lot. Like uh, in 1 Chronicles, if I had just skimmed over that and kind of skipped around, I would have missed the prayer of Jabez. Have you ever read the prayer of Jabez? It's an awesome prayer. Hidden, a gem right there in the midst of all these long chapters of genealogies. If I had skipped the genealogies, when I come to Genesis chapter 5, I would have missed this powerful statement on death and, and what it meant and what it was. I would have missed that if I just skipped over it. 
If we don't study over the genealogies, and there is more than one, of Jesus in the New Testament, well, there are important connections to all of Scripture that we're going to miss. So <clears throat> the genealogies that we see in the Bible, the, the royal bloodline is what it's leading up to. And it provides these important records of historical succession, continuity, legitimacy, and all these lineages also provide important insights for us individually and as families that God can use in our lives to make us understand we can trust what the Word of God says. We can trust that when we're out here living in this world that our God has a plan. He has a plan. The game is coming to an end. And God is going to work it all out, isn't He? All out. And He shows that in these, these genealogies. So let, let's read the King's Royal Bloodline. And we're going to start out, Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. It says here, the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. So this first verse, it carries us all the way from Genesis in the beginning of the Bible, all the way to where we are here in the New Testament as it begins. The book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. It's telling us right away who is this Jesus Christ we're going to be looking at. Do you know Him this morning? Do you really know Him? Or is He just something you've made up in your mind? Does He look like a, 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 a beach dude who up in California with blonde hair and blue eyes and, and long curly hair and, and all these things? Or does He look like the, the 50s one where He had His hair cut off right here? Or, or does He look like He does sometimes in the black church where He looks like He's an African American? Is Jesus just whoever you want Him to be? Or is there a real historical Jesus? There's a real historical Jesus, isn't there? Amen. And He's the one that we need to be following and putting our trust in. Not somebody we make up in our mind, but a real individual who came into this world to save us from our sins, right? And if we know who Jesus is, we know who God is. Because they're the same. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Who is this? Who is this? Jesus. Let's look at the first word. Jesus in the Greek. In the Hebrew, the name means Joshua. Joshua. What does his name ultimately mean? It means God is salvation. God saves. Woo! Amen, right? Amen. That's Jesus, isn't it? When you think Jesus, think God saves. And that's what He's all about. We hear people talking about saving the world in movies and comic books and fictional works and all these different... We hear them talking about in reality and in politics. They're coming and we're going to make it all great again, right? We're going to make the world right. Everything's going to be perfect. The politics say, the environmentalists, he tells us, well, once we clean up the oceans and everything's clean, then everything will be great. I'm going to make everything... I'm going to save the world. Friends, ain't nobody saved the world but Jesus, Right? All you did was put a band-aid on it, okay? Until another time. Only Jesus saves the world. And it's in His name. Jesus, it says here, the Christ. Christ is the word in Greek. Messiah is the word in Hebrew. And the word literally means the anointed one or the promised one. Boy, that tells you why we're looking at this genealogy. He is the promised one, isn't He? God created mankind perfect, right? In the Garden of Eden, then mankind made the choice to go into sin and brought this terrible curse upon us uh, as we see it today, don't we? All around us. We see brother killing brother around us, don't we? Over the color of their skin sometimes. Isn't that sick? Isn't that stupid? Isn't that stupid? We see men greedily adding storage houses while their neighbors are out here starving to death. All around the world, we were talking just this week about how in America, we are the richest people in the entire world, right? People in all these other countries are starving to death around us, and we act like we, we ain't responsible for that, to help out, to help anyone else out. People starving to death right here out in our, our streets, right? And we set up storehouses, storehouses. People mock. They mock love, purity, and forgiveness, right? As they destroy themselves by mocking love, purity, and forgiveness. All that sin, all that sin, and Jesus came, promised 
He's the promise that come to stand in our place and pay the penalty for us for all that sin. All my sin. All your sin. What a great God we have. He would send the promised Savior who would crush sin and the devil. And then it tells us here that He is the Son of David and He is the Son of Abraham. And there's a lot there. It's going to take the rest of the message just to tell you about those two parts right there, okay? This is the preview here before we begin to look at Jesus' right to rule the world and save the world. He gave these genealogies throughout Scripture to keep us looking to see that family line across time and know precisely which family line this promised Savior would be coming through. And even gave prophetic statements about what He would do and how He would be. He'd come here through Abraham's family. Of all the families in all the earth, He's going to be a Jewish man. That tells you something about Him, doesn't it? A Jewish man. So out of all of those, he'll be a Jewish man. Not only that, he's going to be a royal man because he's going to come through David, the king of the Jews, right? So, so let's dig down here into the king's lineage. Now, I'm going to go through these names and don't you laugh if I mess any of them up, okay? We're just going to roll right through. Right here in verse 2. Abraham begat Isaac, and Isaac begat Jacob, and Jacob begat Judas and his brethren. And Judas begat Perez and Zara of Thamar, and Perez begat Isram, and Isram begat Aram, and Aram begat Aminadab, and Aminadab begat Nason, and Nason begat Solomon, and Solomon begat Booz of Rechab, and Booz begat Obed of Ruth, and Obed begat Jesse. Whew. We got through that, all right? <laughs> A little tongue tied right there, right? So we see here. That he's going right to the beginning. He's starting at Abraham and he's showing his lineage as a Jewish man, a son of Abraham. And Matthew is connecting Jesus to the father of the people of Israel. Abraham represents the moment when God selected and separated his family from the rest of all the nations of the world and began to go through that. And when he did that, he looked at Abraham. He did. And he gave him a promise. A promise. Right? Remember what happened back in the garden? Remember how all the world was cursed? In Genesis 12, 1 through 3, he, he began to give him all these promises to the Jewish people. And then he said in verse 3, I will bless them that bless thee and curse him that curseth thee, speaking of that people. And in thee, in thee, in thy seed, in thy loins that will come out of you, shall all the families of the earth be blessed. How are we blessed? Jesus came to save the world, didn't He? All the way back there. You know, they didn't, this book wasn't all put together at one time, okay? This book was spread out all across the centuries in little pieces. And it's been brought together to you right here so you can read it all together. But all this was written by different people at different times throughout all of history. And all of it's coming down to this one line right here. This is a supernatural book. By linking him to Abraham... Matthew brings our attention to the promise of God's rescue plan for the whole world. And we may look out here today and we see how wicked this world is. I was talking about it just a little while ago, right? It's wicked, buddy. Wickeder than I've ever seen it. Wickeder, I don't know if it's wicked as it's ever been, but it's wicked than I've ever seen it, that's for sure. And it goes on all around us. But look here, look close. As you're going through this family line, this name Thamar and Judah. Now, in Hebrew, Thamar uh, is Tamar. And, and, and I'm sure Tamar here, it says, it was with Judas and begat Perez and Zerah, and then Perez, Perez in the Hebrew, uh, actually is the one that continues that family line of Jesus. But oh my goodness, if, I talked about that story a few weeks ago. That's a terrible story, isn't it? She, she deceived everyone. Uh, she tried to have a child here of uh, Judas, Judas's son. Judas's son died because he's wicked. Judas's other son died because he's wicked. And he wouldn't give him his other son, as was her right to have a child to continue on the line. So she does this. She goes off and she dresses up like a prostitute, secretly uh, fools around with her father-in-law so she can have a child to, to, when he, she grows up to take care of her because it was different then than it is now. It was a different society, a different way. And that sounds like the biggest mess I've ever heard in my life. You want to talk about uh, uh, some crazy redneck stuff, right? We're talking about something weird going on right there. But right here it is in Jesus' family line. 
Jesus can take some of the sickest, wickedest things and turn them around to His glory, can He? <laughs> Have y'all come from a from a, a rough situation? How many of y'all been around some wicked, uh, sexual things? How many of y'all been in some, uh, involved in your family and stuff that just make a sailor blush with shame, right? But Jesus could take that and make it shine. Amen. He's going to do that with this world too, isn't He? He's going to take whatever wicked, evil, terrible thing that happened in your past and He's going to turn around to His glory and His good, right? Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let me tell you about my Jesus. And this is what He did. All in part of His plan, not in, psych of, in spite of His plan, but in part of His plan, He takes our, our evil stories and brings them together for His glory. I tell you what, we have an awesome Savior, don't we? And all this has been leading up to this grand unveiling of the King of the Jews, right? And that's why he also, he also, here is the son of David. Follow along with me here again as we go through the roller coaster of names from verse 6. And Jesse begat David the king. And David the king begat Solomon of her that had been the wife of Urias. And Solomon begat Reboam. And Reboam begat Abia. And Abia begat Asa. And Asa begat Josaphat. And Josaphat begat Joram. And Joram begat Ozias. And Ozias begat Jotham. And Jotham begat Achaz. And Achaz begat Ezekias. And Ezekias begat Manassas. And Manassas begat Amon. And Amon begat Josias. And Josias begat Jeconias. And his brethren, about the time they were carried away to Babylon. So we see here the son of David. And it's a description of Jesus that, that Matthew is very fond of calling him the son of David. Because remember, all of Matthew is about him being a king. And what was king? Well, who was the king? David was, right? So this first verse here, or the first verse we looked at, that's the first of ten times he'll say that word, son of David. And he wants to do that to draw attention to the royal line of King David because there was a promise within the royal line of King David that there would be a king on his throne for all of eternity. All of eternity. Let me tell you something. God keeps His promises. Even when it looks like God isn't going to keep His promises, God keeps his promises. How many of y'all got a little downhearted thinking God ain't going to come through here? No, it's time to give up and go on, right? It's time to end all this. Now, I'm just sitting around waiting for the rapture. Well, don't be stupid. You know how many people sit around waiting for the rapture throughout their lives? You know how many people have done that? And you know what? They waste their time sitting around waiting. Even in the Bible, there was people back then. Well, we're just going to sit here. We're going to quit going out and getting something to eat. We're going to have people bring it to us. No! Don't stop working within your church. Don't stop reaching out to this world to see people come to Jesus Christ. Don't stop. Don't stop. Because our God is worthy and He will keep His promises. Abraham, Abraham, he pointed to a belonging here uh, among the people of Israel. But David named promise that Jesus would be royalty, that he'd be this king of the Jews. And the Jews really had only one true king there, as I said, Jehovah God. So this was Matthew's goal to trace Jesus' ancestry through David's son, King Solomon. And now, like I said earlier, there isn't only one genealogy in the New Testament. There's two that tells where the king is coming from, which sounds kind of odd, right? If you're trying to tell, it looks like a contradiction. Why would you have two different genealogies within the New Testament? Right? Because it's supposed to be following one line. What's the purpose? What's the reason in that? Did I not tell you God's the master game player? Watch this, watch this. Now I want you to follow along real close because you'll get lost if you don't. You see, the only, there is a, this other genealogy in Luke's gospel. It's where the family line is traced through David's son Nathan instead of King Solomon. Right here we said David and then it went to Solomon. But over in Luke, we see it going from David down to Nathan. Now, now Matthew is uh, showing Jesus' genealogy through his adoptive father, Joseph. And the one in Luke shows his family tree coming through his mother, Mary. And those two different genealogies don't seem to make sense until you see this. See, throughout the Bible, the devil has been trying, if you'll pay attention to it, 
The devil's been trying to throw everything off track, right? Well, when he heard that Jesus was born, what did he do? He sends a bunch of people to go down there and kill all the babies under two. When he finds out uh, uh, that, that, that this new baby's born with Cain and Abel, what does he do? He gets in old Cain's heart and he causes him to kill his brother. Well, you ain't going to be able to have that son now. Then he throws off and he goes in another direction, right? Through said. And so, so all of these things, God's been working out through the details over time. And, and the devil keeps like counter-moving, counter-moving, counter-moving. Just like in a good game when you play it, right? So the devil's seeking some kind of fine print in the program to stop everything. Can I tell you what? We have a very dumb devil. Okay? We have a very dumb devil. Because there's no way you're going to outsmart God. Yet, yet here we are today, and I bet there's some of us here that might imagine that we could outsmart God. That we would outthink, I'm going to get in another way. I'm coming in the back way or some sense like that. There's only one way. One way. And you better be understanding if you're on the right way, okay? It's only through Jesus. So, so here, here. God had to curse one of these kings of Judah at the time here of Jeconias. Jeconias. Because that king becomes so evil that God took this line of David from the throne. Jeconias there. He's called Kaniah in Jeremiah 22, 24 through 30. And there it says, Thus saith the Lord, Write ye this man childless, a man that shall not prosper in his days, for no man of his seed shall prosper, sitting upon the throne of David and ruling any more in Judah. Wow. And he's right here in Matthew, that name. So if, if this lineage is to show that he is uh, the, the, the king here, it seems like everything just went to pot, didn't it? Everything went downhill. How could Jesus be a descendant of David and still qualify to sit on the throne? Well, because of the genealogy in Luke 3, which is Mary's, which affirms the virgin birth. So according to Jewish usage, Mary's ancestry is given in her husband's name. And in Luke, it says of Joseph that he was of Heli or, or Eli. And, and since Joseph's name, his father here in this one, is said to be from Jacob. We'll read that here in just a moment. Joseph then is being shown in Mary's genealogy as his son-in-law. And that's what's referred to there. Jesus' flesh and blood didn't come through Joseph, but from Mary... Because Jesus was virgin born. Now say, this is a lot, Scott. This is a lot. Well, just keep on going with me here, all right? Unlike Joseph's lineage, which we're looking at here, there was no curse in Mary's genealogy to Jesus sitting on the throne of David. Mary's descent from David come through his son Nathan, not Solomon. But to fulfill his promise to establish David's throne forever, God honored Nathan by making him the flesh-born ancestor of the promised king who would sit on David's throne throughout eternity. And Solomon, the legal heir. So, so how can Mary transmit David's royal inheritance, the right to the throne, to her son since all inheritances had to pass through the male line? Well, according to Israel's law, when a daughter is the only heir, she can inherit her father's possession and rights if she marries within her own tribe. That's in Numbers 27, 1-8, and 36, 6-8. There is no record that Mary had any brothers to inherit her father's possessions and rights. Thus, Joseph became Heli's heir by marriage to Mary, inheriting the right to rule on David's throne. And this right then passes on to Jesus. And Jesus was virgin born of Mary. So all of that works together. You tell me my God ain't a great game planner, okay? You tell me He ain't got all this work together. That old devil ain't going to find anything in the fine print that's going to keep me out of the Lord's presence. Amen, preacher. Don't let him tell you He can keep you out of the Lord's presence. Let me tell you that. This is how intricate God is planning out our lives, playing this game. All of our lives are in His hand, yet many of us seek to squirm out. Both of these genealogies had to be recorded to establish Christ to rule on David's throne. And we wouldn't know that. We wouldn't know that if we didn't study. Study over every word, would we? See, see no matter how evil men become, they might become so evil out here that God says, I, I, not God bless America, but God throw away America. Right? Throw it away. But yet God's going to come things, bring things together, isn't He? Amen. God's going to bring things together. Mm -hmm. No matter how evil it gets. 
God still has a plan. Let's see how that plan is going to work out. Look here in verse, verse 12. Verse 12. And after they were brought to Babylon, Jeconias begot Southiel, and Southiel begot Zorobel, and Zorobel begot Abud, and Abud begot Elikim, and Elikim begot Azor, and Azor begot Sadok, and Sadok begot Akim, and Akim begot Eliad, and Eliad begot Eleazar, and Eleazar begot Methan, and Methan begot Jacob, and Jacob begot Joseph, the husband of Mary, the husband of Mary, of whom was born Jesus, who is called Christ. Amen. Now, I almost felt like I was going through a game there because it seemed like the names got harder as I went along, right? right? But here we are, and we're coming away from, from the, uh, the patriarchs, and we're coming on down through the kings, and now we're here, and we're with the regular Joes. The regular Joes. Isn't it nice? Isn't it nice to know that when God chose to become a man, He didn't come into this world at, th at that time when he could have been this great uh, worldly leader with a lot of money like Abraham had. He didn't come in at a time when he could have stood as a king already established. What did he come in as? At what time in this genealogy? When he was a nobody. He come into this world as a nobody, didn't he? Nobody. A common man. He come into the world as the son of some carpenter nobody ever heard about. To wonder anybody kept his genealogy so anybody could figure out where he come from. This list of names shows this, this, this isn't just a fairy tale. This is a true story, right? God's still using us nobodies, right? Us nobodies. Nobody knows about us. We're just people in this world. But God knows us. And God is using us for His glory. Look at the messed up people. I've already told you about Tamar. There's four women there. There's Ruth. There's Rahab that's mentioned in his, this genealogy and Bathsheba. We've got idolaters. We've got people involved in gross sexual immorality. We've got people with all sorts of different issues going on. Yet, in God, within His grace, allowed all of them to be a part of the plan. Let me tell you something, church. He'll allow each and every one of you to be part of the plan too. Amen. He'll allow you all to be part of the plan. He wants you to be part of the plan, okay? But you've got to get involved in the plan. You know, when I see something good going on, I'm of the mind I want to go there and get involved in it. I don't just want to sit on the sidelines. How many of y'all like to play a game and just sit on the sidelines? Did anybody ever like that when you were in school or something? Okay, you get to sit on the bench for the entire year. Well, why is it when we come to church and we can get out here and, and, and go out here and play this grand game of seeing people saved, we want to sit on the sidelines. We want to sit there. When the game is being played to save the world, I want to be with God in what He is doing and the plan that He has made. Because He just uses these regular Joes. Joseph was a carpenter. But God chose him as the adoptive father of the Messiah. I'm so thankful that God just uses the regular old folks, ain't you? I'm so glad. Let's bring it all together here. i got one more verse. One more verse here. So all the generations from Abraham to David are 14 generations. And from David until carrying away from to Babylon are 14 generations. And from the carrying away into Babylon into Christ are 14 generations. So Matthew here is telling us that genealogy isn't exact. It's 14, 14, 14. That's not how it actually happened in real time, okay? There was probably long gaps in between that that was going on. But this just hits the high point to show us the greatest point. He has, that, that our Savior has come. He is legitimate and it's all part of that grand plan. How many of y'all ever saw that movie in 1994, Forrest Gump? Y'all remember it? Y'all remember the little feather floating on the wind, right? That feather comes in, old Forrest is sitting there, and I like old Forrest. He seems like a likable character. He comes in there, and that little feather comes down, lands near him, he puts it, and he puts it aside. And all throughout the movie, he tells his story, and then at the end, he opens something up, and that feather just floats away, right? Well, that feather, that feather, at least in my understanding, symbolizes how it seems our lives seem to just float around, doesn't it? Everything going on in our life, all the crazy things, we think everything's just floating around. That nothing really matters. It's all just going along. But, but the truth is, and it kind of showed in that movie, even though it looks like everything's just floating around in the wind, God has a grand design to bring that feather right where it needs to be when it needs to be there, doesn't He? A grand design for each and every one of these regular Job's lives out here today and this regular Job behind this pulpit. 
God has a grand design that is going along. And isn't that comforting? Isn't that comforting? Life's like a box of chocolates. You never know what you're going to get, right? <laughs> but the fact is, God does know. He, he owns the chocolate factory. He put together it all, right? He's got all this designed out. And, and when we rebel and we strike out against His design, He'll just work it out a different way. As they said in, so long ago to Esther, if you don't come and stand for the kingdom for such a time as this, God will find some other way. He's going to bring her on His great plan. It's all going to come to fruition, isn't it? It's all going to come to fruition. But you get to have a part for such a time as this. For such a time as this. Think Abraham understood it all when he was sitting out there in the desert. <laughs> well, I know he was like, man, why am I here in the desert? Why am I having to, to take my son up here on a hill and, 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 and it seems like he's going to have me sacrifice? Why is all these bad things happening in my life? Why are all these strugglers occurring? Right? God has a grand plan. Huh? David, David, uh, his, he messed his life up royally, didn't he? <laughs> Talk about a royal person. He messed it up royally. He, he slept with another man's wife. He killed a man. He caused all this turmoil within his family. It was a mess. All these things were going on all around him. And yet here he is. Right here in his genealogy. He said, I'm going to follow you, God. I'll mess up a lot. I'm going to follow you. I'm going to follow you to the end. And old Joseph... When they told him that Mary was going to give birth and it wasn't his, and he was like, what's going on? He chose just to trust the plan. Trust the plan and move forward. And the question is, are we seeking to live our lives along with the plan? Or are we fighting against God's grand design here this morning? Are we going to go with Him? Or are we going to go with ourselves? Friends, I want to go with Him. Can I tell you something about going against His plan? You ain't going to win that fight. You're not going to win it. And He loves you. And His plan's the best. This morning, I want to ask you, wherever you're at, if you're online, watching right now, bend your knee to the King. Bend your knee to the King. He's got it all in motion. We just need to humble it. We quit need to think of the world's on our shoulders and allow it to be on His. Don't we? We do. Some of us are walking around we think the world's all on us. All on, if I don't do it, it's not going to come to pass. Let me tell you what, God's going to bring it to come to pass and you get to have the joy of being a part of it. So just be happy. Right? Jump in there and be happy that you have something to do for God. Because that's what it's all about. I hope you're enjoying the sermons here and have subscribed to my channel on YouTube, but I would love even more to meet with you in person at the church where I'm blessed to pastor at in White Pine, Tennessee, Omega Baptist Church. We are a Bible-believing church called to love all people without bias by proclaiming and teaching the Word of God through the power of the Holy Spirit. We are located directly off of Exit 4 off of Interstate 81 in Tennessee. You can see us clearly from the interstate. We have worship each Sunday at 1030 and I hope you'll make plans to join us. It's all about Jesus, my friend, and we pray that we may be able to have the opportunity to share with you personally the life-changing gospel of Jesus Christ.